Have you noticed how many of our youth are struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts? They are going through so much stress and so much depression and substance use that we as a society are seeing something that we have never faced before. Suicide has become the second biggest cause for death in young adults. And when, when there is a loss of a young life, it not only affects that person, but affects the whole family, the whole community. And so there is so much repercussions of that. And we as a society need to do more, more work to prevent that from happening and not just crying after the fact. So would you like to learn some skills and tools that may help you as a parent, as a teacher, as a caring adult to help the young adults around us, then you are in the right place. Welcome to the Happy and Healthy Mind. My name is Dr. Rosina. Over the last 20 years, I have been serving as medical doctor, specializing in psychiatry, a best-selling author, and a transformative speaker. I believe that our mind is the software that runs the hardware for both our brain and our body. Therefore, I share practical tips for your mental fitness so you can live your best life without burnout and unnecessary suffering. Please consult your healthcare professional for any specific advice. If you find this content helpful, then join our mission of eradicating preventable suffering and suicides by liking, subscribing, and sharing so more people can live their best life with hope, health, and happiness. And today our guest is Jackie Simmons. Thank you, Jackie, for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. You're welcome. You're welcome. So Jackie is a TEDx speaker, international best-selling author, creator of Conscious Transformational Coaching. With her three daughters, she co-founded the Teen Suicide Prevention Society and launched the mission to make teen suicide a thing of the past. And the mission has grown to include two books, three programs, and the talk that saves life. Let's learn from her. So Jackie, how did this topic become important in your life? There's two stories. It became important in my life two times. The first was the summer of 1995. My daughters, I have three daughters, they were getting ready. They were all in junior high and high school. They were getting ready to go visit their dad one state away for the summer. If you've got daughters, more than boys, but daughters, that means only one thing. Shopping, <laughs> shopping, let's go shopping. Oh my goodness. My middle daughter, Stephanie was 14, you know, in between her sisters, in between schools and in between clothing sizes. So the shopping became an adventure. Outfit after outfit. Oh my goodness. Store after store. Nothing fit her. <laughs> At the end of the day, we came home with nothing except an attitude. You know, we got home, Stephanie stormed up the stairs to the bathroom and I collapsed on the sofa, just grateful to be off my feet and have peace and quiet. And then I heard, mom, I think I need help. And my eyes were drawn to Stephanie's left arm. Blood was dripping down her fingers onto the wood floor. The emotional part of my brain started screaming in terror at the sight of my obviously suicidal child. Then the practical part of my brain started flipping through the file folders in my head looking for the date of her last tetanus shot. Have, have you ever been calm and panicky at the same time? <laughs> Many times. I think as, as parents, as mothers, we get the, those experiences again and again. Yeah. I mean, I wrapped her in my arms, assessed the wounds, and they weren't life-threatening. So we bandaged her arm and made plans to visit the local teen mental health facility the next day. The tears finally stopped. The mutual I'm sorry's were shared. And Stephanie slept. I couldn't risk being away from her. So we were sleeping in the living room. And between us, 
was a handwritten note, her promise not to harm herself again while I slept. Yeah, right. Like I was going to close my eyes that night. Yeah. All night I stared into the darkness, listened to her breathe, and was just grateful that she was alive. And my brain just spun. You know, what happened? How did, how did, how did this happen? We were a stable middle-class American family. And who's to blame? It had to be somebody's fault, right? Mother's guilt. Oh my God. Mother's guilt. Yeah, mother's guilt. We, we went into years of counseling, therapy, medications, interventions, hospitalizations, and 13 more attempts. Scary. Uh, it, it, well, it was, yeah, scary is, is an understatement. I mean, Stephanie is amazingly resilient. Um, and I, I did something that I have had to come to terms with. And so this is another piece of my story. I sold myself on the idea that as long as Stephanie was getting professional help, we didn't need to talk about it. The truth was, I didn't want to talk about it. Talk about mother's guilt. I mean, would you want to know what could cause your child so much mental and emotional pain that they thought dying was better than living? I didn't want to know. So I didn't ask. And I remained silent. And that silence lasted 20 three years. And then on August the 3rd, 2019, my daughter, Stephanie, now 37, delivered a seven minute talk, a message that matters. I'm super proud of my daughter. I mean, the morning of her talk, well, it was sunny and it was already hot because the venue was on the outside of Sarasota, Florida. I walked in and greeted into the conference room, greeted Stephanie and the other speakers I had trained to deliver these messages. And Stephanie was getting into that nervous, excited state you get into right before you give a talk. She looked amazing with her hair pulled back in combs and a dark blouse and a flowery skirt. Super proud of her. She was first up on the speaker's roster and everything that day worked. The PowerPoints worked, the, the videographer was there, the microphones worked. It was awesome. I welcomed her to the front of the room. Everybody help me welcome Stephanie Ashton. And she confidently walked up and shook my hand. And then she said, 3,000 teenagers will attempt to take their own lives today, just in the USA. And in the back of the room, I was stunned. I mean, twice. One, I had no idea the number was that high. And I also had no idea suicide was her topic. She continued with, when I was 14, after a bad day of shopping, I stood in my bathroom. The pain of not fitting into any clothes was just more proof that I didn't fit in anywhere. And that pain was more than I could bear. So I took a razor and cut into my left arm, trying to end the pain and my life. In the back of the room, I felt the blood drain out of my face. Have you ever been hijacked by a bad memory? I mean, I, it was 30 years of stress management training is the only reason I didn't crawl into a corner and just bawl my eyes out. And Stephanie kept talking. <laughs> she said, outside of professional help, well, it wasn't my only attempt. There were others. And outside of getting professional help, I've never really talked about it. Uh, not even with mom. Mom and I talked around it. It was too painful, too awkward, too easy to avoid. Mom and I had the other talks. Mom and I had the talk about sex. And we had the talk about drugs and we had the talk about alcohol. And then I went to college on a dry campus. That means the kegs were hidden in the showers of the girls dorm. Mom and I had to talk about alcohol more than once, but we didn't talk about suicide. 
and I still struggle with suicidal thoughts. And in the back of the room, I went from pale to bone cold. As I realized the struggles that my daughter had faced alone, because I didn't have the courage to have the talk about suicide. Stephanie wound up her talk by saying, along my suicide avoidant journey, I've learned tons of coping skills. Now I want to teach those skills to teens before they need them. Yes, before they need them. There wasn't a dry eye in the room, including mine. Everybody gave her a standing ovation. People were rushing up and hugging her and thanking her for being so brave and so vulnerable. And in the back of the room, I was frozen. I was totally torn between pride for her bravery and guilt and shame for my cowardice. And Dr. Rosina, then it hit me. 3,000 teenagers attempting to take their own lives every day means that every day 6,000 parents start to live that guilt nightmare that I had lived. And that meant over 20,000 grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, and sisters. Like you mentioned, it impacts the whole family. And hundreds of thousands of classmates, teachers, neighbors, boyfriends, girlfriends, all living the guilt nightmare that I had lived every day. And then I wondered, what if Stephanie was right? What if the key to preventing suicide was as simple as having the talk about suicide before you think it's needed? And it's something so simple and obvious that it's like putting wheels on luggage, you know, simple and obvious solutions. So what happened after that day is Stephanie and I decided to work together. I mean, who knew that was possible? Along with her sisters, we co-founded the Teen Suicide Prevention Society. It became a nonprofit on April the 1st of 2020, right as COVID shut everything down. We started with the book, Make It a Great Day, The Choice is Yours, bunches of stories to help teens break the silence and start the conversation because we realized that when it comes to suicide, silence isn't golden, it's deadly absolutely deadly. So the journey began and we ended up taking and creating a guide for parents to have that talk to stop suicidal thoughts from getting stuck in a kid's head. And what came out of that was a program to teach people how to be an advocate for living first for themselves and then for others. And from that, now we are doing the conscious transformational coaching through my company where we help people who are struggling permanently resolve their negative emotional history. So without ever having to talk about what their problems were. So that's been the journey that we have been on. And what we have discovered is that even the thought of having the talk that one that I had, my challenge is seems to be a universal challenge. I had bought into the myth that I could put the thought into my daughter's head. I was afraid I would put that thought back in her head. And that's why that was one of the things behind me not talking about it with her. Yeah. You would have thought after 14 attempts, I'd have figured out that the thought was there. But yeah, there's no limit to what we will do as, as parents to protect ourselves from pain or as people to protect ourselves from pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm so glad that you're bringing. I'm I'm really proud of you, and I'm proud of your daughters, and for doing this wonderful job. Because, you know, I really feel that many times we wait till the the feared situation happens. And I did a program previously with a child mental health counselor on the mental health first aid. And mm -hmm. so I'm really glad that they are doing more of that. So more parents and more teachers and more organizations are learning the, that first aid to prevent things from escalating. But I always believe that you need 
before somebody starts thinking about suicide, they go through so long, so much of suffering before that. It doesn't happen automatically one day. It keeps on building up. So if we can give these tools, these techniques to our youth before they reach that point, not only we would prevent the suffering, we would also prevent the suicide or people going to that point of suicide. So we really need to work on this prevention. And, and that is you know, one of my mission and that's why I am working on teaching people these practical tools for mental fitness. And as part of, you know, I have shared with my audience before that I'm working on a book called Dodging Depression. For that, I have did the, I have done all this research about all the prevention tools that are showing how you can actually prevent depression from occurring or delay the onset of depression from occurring. And so all we can do to help prevent would save a lot of suffering. So we'd love to learn some of your tools that you were talking about that listening, uh, people who are listening to us could apply in their life to save a life. Awesome. Thank you. I, I This is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, but instead of talking about it, would it be okay if we demonstrated how to have the talk that saves lives? It's four simple questions. Wonderful. Yeah, I think, you know, showing is always working, works better than telling. So yeah, let's do it together and let's show and provide some, some idea of how to do that talk. All right, so parents, listen up. The invitation is the beginning of everything. If you tell your teen you want to have the talk, their eyes are gonna roll back in their heads and you're you know, not gonna be able to penetrate. So what we came up with was an invitation and it sounds like this. Hey, I've decided to be part of the mission to stop teen suicide. They gave me a guide. I need to practice. Would you have 10 minutes tomorrow to help me practice my guide? When you ask it this way, it's not about them because we don't want to talk about ourselves if we're already struggling. So you do this with, before you think that they're struggling or if they are struggling, go ahead, use this to break the ice. When they say yes, you plan a time for the talk. The rule is it's always planned. We never blindside anybody with the topic of suicide. It's too personal guys. And the talk is really simple. So Dr. Rosina, Thank you for helping me practice the guide to stop suicide. It's only four questions. Are you ready? I am. Question one. Have you heard about the rise in teen suicides? Yes. Thank you. Question two. Do you have a story? Do you have a friend who's tried or died? Yes. Thank you. Question three. Have you ever thought of leaving that way? No. Thank you. Question four. Hey, Dr. Rosina, why stay? Tell why, what, what's so good about your life you want more of it? Why stay? What are your reasons for staying? Well, I feel like life is a gift and I want to make the best out of it. And yeah, so uh, I, uh, the purpose of living is to make a difference in other people's life. And if I'm dead, then I won't be able to do that. <laughs> That's a good reason. Parents, when you're having this talk with your kids and you get to question four, get excited because they're going to tell you what's so good in their lives. And so this is all written out for you step by step by step. And this has been designed based on my understanding of neuroscience and how the brain works. So it's designed to have safety for everybody. And here's the deal. If you're talking with your child and they say yes to question three, they have thoughts of leaving. Don't panic. Take a deep breath. You're fine. Thoughts of leaving are normal. Freud said that suicidal thoughts are normal. They're part of our problem solving mechanism, our natural negative bias. So don't panic. When you ask them, why stay? What are your reasons for staying? And they have zero reasons. And you ask, you know, what's so good about your life? You want more of it. And they have zero reasons. 
then you stay with them and call 911. This is not the time to call an 800 number. This is when you call 911 and you get intervention. Now, I've got some really interesting statistics on this for everybody. Out of the thousands of talks, the number of times that 911 has needed to be called or that someone called in and, and said, yeah, they needed to call the 800 number and get a suicide intervention specialist on the line. There's one exception to this. Otherwise, it's zero. Zero. It doesn't happen. I'll tell you the exception and then I'll tell you why it never happens. So the exception was when someone was asked to have the talk with their son because th their son's wife was worried that they were suicidal. So there were a lot of signs that this was an issue. So that's the only time that that has ever even come up. He cried, his depression lifted in two days, and then he sought professional help to keep it from coming back. So just getting in touch with their reasons for staying, and he had reasons for staying, thank goodness. But the reason it never happens, I finally figured it out because I was really curious. I mean, statistically, it should have occurred with all the talks we've done. Should have happened, but it doesn't. And it doesn't for the very reason that you must have this talk before you think it's needed. People struggling with depression, people struggling with suicidal thoughts are really, really good at one thing, masking. They hide it. So when you get to question four and you ask, why stay? What are your reasons for staying? They're going to lie. And it doesn't matter if they lie because their brain is still hearing them answer the question that they have reasons for staying. So their brain starts a new neural pathway like a file folder that's labeled reasons for staying. And we're backing them away from an edge that we don't need to know whether or not they're near. And it works every time because the brain works that way. And we just kind of did a Jedi mind trick on your listeners. Because of resonance, because of mirror neurons, when you were answering the questions, Dr. Rosina, same thing was happening in their brains. So everyone who's listening to this just got backed away from an edge. They may not have even known they were near. And what's so important about this is we believe that if we can build a buffer between you and the edge, you will never need to be talked off a ledge. Yeah, and I think that's like, you know, when I am talking to my patients, you know, I have, I always have to ask them if they've thought about, you know, ending life or, or if it's life worth living and stuff like that. And when I see somebody having any of those thoughts, I ask them, what is the strength that got you to not go further on that thought? What was the grounding thing that is helping you? And so, you know, in, in a way, you're asking the same thing. What is good going in your life? And mm -hmm. that's why, you know, they, their mind shifts. And when I'm doing the gratitude challenge, like every time I'm seeing a patient and I'm writing the prescription, then I ask, what are you, tell me three things you're grateful for. It kind of brings their mind from what all the problems they were having to what is good in their life. And that is a way of kind of shifting the mind. So you're putting it very beautifully in the way it's like, you know, what, what are your reasons to stay, uh, stay? My question to you is many times when people are depressed, they, they don't see the reasons to stay. And so how do you bring them from, nothing is going right in my mind, in my life. And, and if they answer like that, mm -hmm. and a teenager, who, a young yeah. adult who is feeling down, they're likely to answer, there's nothing good in my life. So what do you do then? You know, I would have thought that that would happen more, but in this framework where we have taken them from the macro and brought it down to their environment and then into their, their brain, when they get to the reasons for staying, they always have reasons because if they're struggling, they're going to lie. They're not going to tell you that they're struggling. At this point, they know you're talking about suicide. They're not going to tell you at that point. They're going to lie, which it starts to build the buffer. Now, we have another tool called the Why Not Workbook that we also have. We highly recommend that families do this together. 
because it works with the natural negative bias of everybody's brain. If we had start the talk with asking people what's good in your life, you're absolutely right. They will shut us out because teens shut us out anyway. Right. But when you approach it from, will you help me? The first thing you've done when you issue the invitation is you've triggered that part of their brain that likes to help. You know, the little two or three year old inside everybody. Oh, goody, I get to help. It's still there inside the teenager. They just don't jump up and down as much. So you've triggered a feel good chemical already, which is already breaking the cycle of the chemicals in the body that go with depressive thoughts and go with suicidal thoughts. So believe it or not, just issuing the invitation starts breaking what we call the negative echo chamber of the mind. There's a challenge in the world about talking about suicide and I'm going to bring it up. We're afraid to. And we are afraid to for very good reason. And some that didn't make sense to me. My daughter shared that she didn't talk about it because she didn't want to be a burden. Other people have shared they didn't talk about it because they didn't want to worry their family. They didn't want to have to go see somebody. They didn't want to acknowledge it themselves. They wanted to believe that it's just a passing thing and I'm fine. Well, in my world, fine is an acronym. It stands for frenzied, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> so we discovered that there's another reason too, because there's all the public stigma around it. You know, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your family. So we've got this whole cultural um, drama going on. You don't air your dirty laundry in public. You know, that was a big one for me growing up. And then they created the uh, must report laws that require certain people with certain licenses to report if they have a patient or a client that's it, it, that shares that they're struggling with suicidal thoughts. And that 72 hour psychiatric hold scares the crap out of people and many people Many doctors interpret the letter of the law. They don't believe they have any leeway in it. And if I hadn't been interviewing the director of the Suicide Institute in New York City, I wouldn't have believed how strong this is. He has a new primary care doctor. You know what it's like when you go to a new doctor, right? You, know, you get the whole pile of forms that you sit and you fill it out. He takes the forms back to the nurse at the desk. And she says, okay, this is great. Oh, um, are you sure you want to answer this question this way? And he's like, well, I'm not going to lie. The next thing he knew, he was in a wheelchair with an armed security guard on either side of him. And he was escorted into the psychiatric intake ward of the hospital. One of the nurses recognized him because he teaches clinicians and nurses how to have a talk that's that, that when somebody's suicidal and they're like, what are you doing here? He's, and he told them and they're like, okay, let's, let's fix this. But it is that push. So when we realized that if people were waiting for people to have a sign that they were something suicidal or something really going wrong, people are really good at hiding them and they have all of those reasons. So we came up with a slogan. Our slogan is, we believe waiting for signs is looking for trouble. Because we live in a day and an age where often the first sign is an attempt and they don't all survive. And it's not a parent's fault that we can't see signs that in hindsight we can see. It's not our fault. It's the reticular activating system in our brain that screens out things that don't match our primary belief. And what parent doesn't have a primary belief system that says, my kid's okay. So once I understood what the problem was that we can't see the signs in our own children because our brain is hardwired to not see them. I realized that we had to go pure prevention. We had to get as upstream as possible from the problem 
And so that's how the talk that saves lives got born. Wonderful, wonderful. I just want to clarify, you know, you told the story about the person being wheeled in to the psych unit. And it's kind of the extreme example because 20% of Americans do feel suicidal at some point in time. And we don't hospitalize everybody. Yeah. Hospitals are very, very tight. There is very high bar that is created. So like if I want to hospitalize a patient, the patient has to be acutely suicidal. They're not able to stay safe outside. And that's when I can request hospitalization. I cannot detain a person in our state. Uh, unless they go through the CDMHP evaluation. So I just, you know, I want to clarify to the oh, audiences yes. that in reality, in reality, that is not true. So if somebody is feeling suicidal, it is important to be truthful and it is important to bring it out. It's better to be, oh. uh, to be able to get the help rather than suffer, you know, risking the loss of life. It is so much better to get the help and that is, like I said, that was one doctor's office taking a very literal approach to what the law says in New York. Yeah. But it highlighted the fact that when people don't know what the truth is, they don't know that they can talk to someone like you, that they can, call, well, shoot, there's anonymous 800 numbers they can call with right. trained right. intervention specialists. Yeah. Yeah. We partnered with Evolution Health and created a free depression free and anonymous screening for depression and anxiety. And so you know, these tools are available. You can get help without needing to deal with the big, scary, hairy, hairy, scary yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times you're kind of reacting to that fear and mm -hmm. until it kind of really becomes more severe. So like you said, you, we want to take prevention measures before it is needed. We want to do a, uh, do our best to build that mental resilience, to build mm -hmm. that mental fitness. So when those those moments, those episodes come, the person is able to come out of it healthier and stronger. You know, we have like pa gone past our time okay. and we were having uh, so much fun that I didn't want it to interrupt you. So let's kind of wrap up our message for our audience and then we can kind of follow up with the future programs if needed. Would you kind of wrap up your message in the sense is like, what are some of the things that could happen if we don't do these talks, if we don't take preventive measures and what kind of benefits we can get if we do and any take home message you may have? The Center for Disease Control released a statistic that shocked me, that our young adults in America, 25% are struggling with suicidal thoughts. 25% of our teenagers, our young adults, our 20 year olds are struggling with suicidal thoughts. So the problem, if we don't change how we are having this conversation or not having the conversation, is that we're at risk of losing a generation. And if you're willing to have the talk that saves lives, if you're willing to use the simple tools like the Why Not Workbook and strengthen those mental and emotional muscles, we call it building emotional resilience. You can invite your kids to have it into what we call emotional cage fighting and help them learn to have the talks with their friends. What will happen? When you have the talk with the 20 people in your life that you would miss the most if they were gone, that's the only criteria for who to invite. The 20 people in your life that you would miss the most. When you do that and you help them do that, we will change the tide of this epidemic of teen suicide. What a powerful message. Yes, I second it. Identify people that you love and care about and talk with them openly. Spread the message let's make this suicide something of past. And here is the website that if you guys want to get learn more about this, you can visit teensuicidepreventionsociety.com. And Jackie has been gracious to share uh, the gift of the talk that saves life. You can get it by uh, going to our website, happyandhealthymind.com and clicking the resources or going directly to their website. And if you would like us to send you the text for the reminders for the future programs 
or ask questions during these live programs, text us the word joyful to the number 38470, and we'd be happy to send you the reminders and resources. We don't have time for the special today, so I'm just going to leave you with this question. Every day you get an opportunity to take a step. What are you going to choose to do today? Are you going to leave things to the to chances or are you going to take the steps to save a life, a friend, a youth and take the step of taking the preventive steps? On that note, I leave you. Stay safe, happy and healthy. Till next time, Dr. Rosina. And thank you, Jackie, for joining us.